this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. Welcome back to another episode of More Than. And in this program, what I would like to look at what is more or who is more than a prophet. We've all heard that, that the King Messiah, he would have to be a prophet like unto Moses. And of course, Messiah Yeshua was a prophet like unto Moses, but wasn't he more than a prophet? And why would the people in his time notice something that he did and say, surely this is the prophet? What made them say that? Because he did so many other things. Why would it be that thing that made them say, this is surely the prophet? So let's back up a little bit to the Song of Songs. And let's look at maybe the, the basis for this. Uh, and this, the passage I want to quote here is Song of Songs 4.4. 4. It says, Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones, of which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. You say, well, that's just a pretty poetical passage. But remember, it's prophecy. The Song of Songs is prophecy of the ingathering of the exiles by Messiah. So let's kind of keep that as our, our working text. Because what we know about these, these rows of round shields, the Tower of David, is that the shields of the warriors of course, could be hung on a tower. It could be very intimidating to see, oh my goodness, look at all those shields, look at all the warriors they have. Uh, but in this case, the shields are thought to be representative of the thousand generations. You know, his promises extend to a thousand generations. Who is that? Well, it's the promise given to Abraham that's extended to a thousand generations. So these shields are thought to specifically represent the offspring of Abraham, that there is a righteous remnant in every generation. And that righteous remnant in every generation, they form a faithful shield to their generation. If those people didn't stand up in that generation, then that generation, you know, is in a very precarious position. It would be the Elijahs and the Elishas and the Samuels and, and the Peters and the James and the Johns and, and all of those who stood up in their generation and they sacrificed. They were holy warriors to preserve the word of Adonai, to preserve his covenant, to preserve the promises that were given to Abraham. And so that remnant in each generation, as you look at the tower, the way that it's described, it's there's rows of shields going up. And so as each generation places their shield, their righteous remnant, they hang up their shield for their generation on that tower, you can see how little by little the layers of the tower are filled in and they just go up and up and up. And there's not one generation that's missing. There is a righteous remnant in every generation. So at the end, when the last shield of the last generation is put into place, there's not going to be any empty spots. The entire tower is going to be comprised of the shields of the generations of Abraham. You say, well, where am I? I'm not descended from Abraham. Oh, yes, you are. If you believe in Messiah Yeshua, if he is your savior, if you were walking with him in the living word, you are a descendant of Abraham. You can be part of that righteous remnant. You can be a shield of your generation because the word that you proclaim is a shield to your generation. So let's look at judgment, right? You say, well, what does this have to do with why Yeshua was truly the prophet? We're just going to set some things up here, right? We're not necessarily setting them up to knock them down, but I think we're setting them up to, 
to be able to set what he did on a particular foundation. So there's a, a passage that says, Elohim, in the Psalms, Elohim stands in the divine assembly. In the midst of the judges, he shall judge. It's Psalm 82, 1. So that Psalm is speaking of judges. It was, in temple times, it was recited on the third day of the week. There was a specific psalm assigned to specific days. And as we think of Elohim standing in the divine assembly, he would kind of be like the tower itself. He would be the stones. He would be the the eternal. And then the shield of each generation would be hung on that tower. What does it say? The, the name of yod heh vav is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Right? So the, the shields of their generation do more than just run into the tower. They actually are partners with the tower and provide protection through their prayers, through their sacrifices for their generation. Now, why would they pick the third day? for this particular psalm. Elohim stands in the divine assembly in the midst of the judges, he shall judge. Well, what do we know about the third day? Well, if we go back to the creation, the third day of creation, then doesn't matter which side you start from really, because you always end up in the middle when you're looking at the menorah. But let's say one, two, third day of creation, he's going to create light. Uh, He's going to separate light from darkness on the first day. He's going to separate the waters from the waters on the second day. And then on the third day, he gathers those waters and dry land can appear. So that's the time that the earth, which is the substance of a human being, the physical substance of a human being, that's the first time it's appearing in the earth. And so a day of judgment is associated with the third day because now there is an appearing. Judgment, the the role of judgment is to render visible that which is concealed, right? So just parting the waters on the second day, it's still concealed in the waters. But in order for the creation to begin to be revealed through judgment on the third day, he gathers those waters into one place so that the dry land can appear. And judgment is a matter of counsel. Counsel. In Hebrew, the word for counsel is etza. Etza. And you can hear the word etz in etza. Etz is a tree. Well, what happens on the third day? Once that dry land appears, now it says the trees begin to grow. So the trees, the etzim in plural, were created on the third day. There's a principle of judgment there. The trees apparently were there all the time, just waiting to be revealed. And so often that's what judgment does. The answer is concealed until... Through counsel, it's revealed. And this is what Moses was told. He says, you're going to be a judge to Pharaoh. You're going to reveal that which Pharaoh has been concealing from his people. You are going to reveal a nation that Pharaoh has tried to conceal. And he says, Moses, you're going to be, and this is strange, you're going to be an Elohim to Pharaoh. Now, the thing to remember about Elohim is there's Elohim with a big E, (laughs) a big Aleph in in, uh, spelling it, the creator. And then there's Elohim with the small E, which can mean a judge, a ruler, an official, and so forth. You have to be able to tell from context whether it's the creator or a judge, a ruler, or whatever. But he says, Moses, you're going to give counsel. You're going to be a judge to Pharaoh. 
you are going to reveal that which is concealed. You are going to reveal that the magicians really can't do what I can do. What else do we know about Moses? We know that Moses was drawn out of the water. Well, what happened on the second day? The waters were separated from the waters. Then the dry land appeared. Then the trees began to grow. Then there was counsel. This was through a spirit of counsel, of revealing that which has been concealed so that it can grow. And that's even what Moses' name means in Hebrew, Moshe. It means the drawing out, like the drawing out of water, being rescued. So not only was Moses the Israelite lawgiver, the, the great judge of Israel, but he was also an Elohim, a judge. Elohim can mean a judge to Pharaoh. That's what we do in judgment. We try to draw out the truth so that we can make decisions. Now, if we overlay, for instance, the seven feasts with the menorah, what do we have? We have Passover, we have the days of unleavened bread, and then we have the feast of first fruits, the first fruits of the barley. And we know that Yeshua was resurrected on the third day. Right? So that's consistent. That's when he was crucified on a tree. Judgment took place. That which was concealed was revealed through the crucifixion and the resurrection on the third day of Messiah Yeshua. So this offering of the first fruits of the barley that's associated with that particular moed, um, it's literally when the first fruits appeared in the earth, the third day. They, that which was concealed was now revealed. And then you start counting the days to Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. It's like a little jubilee every year. There's the 50-year jubilee. There's the seventh year Shemitah. But every single year, you're going to have Shavuot, the little jubilee. And Passover really isn't considered concluded and sealed up until Shavuot because the counting begins during Passover. You can't disconnect Shavuot from Passover. It's, they're linked by counting the days. So what's another three? What's a, another example of judgment or counsel associated with the three. Well, I'm not sure if you have a Sidur. If you want to spell that in English, it's S-I-D-D-U-R. It's a prayer book. Um, Jews have prayer books for their prayers. And in a Sidur, there are specific prayers set for specific occasions uh, the daily prayers like Daniel did and so forth. And as you read through them, you'll realize that they're mostly scripture, right? You're praying his word back to him because his word doesn't return void. And it doesn't mean that you can't have spontaneous personal prayer as part of it. You absolutely can and should. But there's certain business of the kingdom that the Siddur makes sure you take care of every day or at the appointed times, at the Moedim, at the feast times. And there's also blessings after meals. It's called the Birkat Hamazon, blessing after meals. That third blessing, again, of the seven, that third blessing is the blessing for Jerusalem. And then the fourth blessing is for the goodness of Adonai. The fourth feast commemorates, again, the end of the barley and the beginning of the wheat as a first fruit. And it's going to lead back again to the Tower of David, that Yeshua is a tower of salvations to his king. And it, it's the righteous shields of the generations that are hung on that tower. And this is all, again, a matter of judgment because 
What will the righteous do in the millennium? They will also be judging with King Messiah. But I want to read that, that third blessing for you. It's an interesting blessing. And here's how it goes. That, and this is, again, for weekdays. There's a little bit different uh, set up on Shabbat, but for weekdays. Uh, it says, he who makes great the salvations of he who is a tower of salvations to his king and does kindness for his anointed to David and to his descendants forever. And we've been looking at the Tower of David, the shields of our generations. And so the blessing starts out acknowledging the salvations of the king and alludes to David. Sometimes in scripture, it will mention an ancestor in place of someone who comes later. For instance, if he's referring to King Messiah, a descendant of David, he might mention David in the place of it. He's the anointed. What is Messiah Yeshua? He is the anointed one, like David. It says, young lions may want and hunger, but those who seek Hashem, Adonai, will not lack any good. I was a youth and also have aged, and I have not seen a righteous man forsaken with his children begging for bread. All the day he is gracious and lends, and his children are a blessing. That which we have eaten shall be for satiety, and that which we have drunk shall be therapeutic, and that which we have left over, pay attention to that, that which we have left over shall be for a blessing. As it is written, he placed it before them, and they ate and left over as the word of Hashem. You were blessed of Hashem, maker of heaven and earth. Blessed is the man who trusts in Hashem. Then Hashem will be his security. Hashem will give might to his people. Hashem will bless his people with peace. And that's from the art scroll, uh, Sephardic Sidur. It's specifically a Sephardic one. If you've got an Ashkenazi version, it, it, it's going to read a little bit differently. But that's what I love about this. It's mentioning a specific incident that goes along with this third blessing. It says when you drink, that it's going to be therapeutic. What did Yeshua say about if you will drink from him? It's going to be therapeutic. You'll never thirst again. And that which we have left over shall be for a blessing. And they're quoting from a particular place in Scripture when they say, he placed it before them, they ate and left over as the word of Hashem, of yod heh So the bread, if you caught it, was equated with the word of Adonai that is eaten. And it completely satisfies the one who eats. Yet, it's never completely consumed. How is that possible? Have you ever noticed that when miraculous bread is supplied, there's always some left over. They can't eat it all. That's a little strange. There's always going to be word bread that's left over for a blessing. Remember when Yeshua told the woman of his water? He's referring to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you'll drink from this, you're never going to thirst again. And there's still going to be plenty of water. You don't have to thirst again because you're never going to run out of this water. There will always be plenty. And he's saying the same thing here about the bread. The bread of Yeshua is never going to be reduced to crumbs. There's always going to be a bunch left over. The water's never going to run out. It's only going to increase for healing. It says it'll be therapeutic. The bread's never going to deplete. It's only going to grow in the more blessing. Now, that's an incredible picture. It's kind of like Moses, who was drawn out of the water, the Torah. Moses, by the first century, when you said Moses, depending on context, you either meant the person himself or you meant the five books of Moses, the word 
of Adonai. Moses came to represent the Torah. And so the bread of the word is drawn out of the water of the Ruach HaKodesh. Remember how even the manna, how it came down like dew and then it distilled? That the bread actually came out of the water? Well, when the word is ministered with the Holy Spirit, there's fullness, there's healing, and there's blessing. And you don't ever have to worry like, oh, let me just stuff myself because there might not be more tomorrow. There will be plenty tomorrow. You don't have to overdrink. The river's always going to flow. So this reference about the bread being left over in that third blessing, it's based on a scripture about a miracle that Elisha performed over bread, barley bread to be specific. That should sound familiar. And this is from 2 Kings 442 through 44. 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44. It says, Now, a man came from Baal Shalisha. Baal Shalisha. Now I know when you hear Baal, you think of a, a strange God. It doesn't always mean that. You have to know what it's talking about in context. It means a master of something, like a professional, right? The, there was a guy, a rabbi called the Baal Shem Tov. It meant that he was a master of the good word, right? He had excelled. Um, let's just use a, a secular example. I've got a master's degree in secondary education. What does that mean? I'm a master of how people learn at the level of secondary education. Well, maybe a long time ago. It's been a long time. Uh, but that's all it means in that context. So don't, like, don't let your cockles go up when you read the word Baal. Make sure that it, it fits the context. Baal Shalisha, Shalisha Shalosh is three. And that's why I, I kind of prepared the way by talking about the third day of creation, the third spirit of Adonai, which is Etza. So we would see how it ties into Shavuot there. So this man who comes, it says, is a master of the third. Well, what do we know about the third? Well, we just reviewed some bullet points about the third day of creation, the spirit of counsel, Etza, one of the three, uh, one of the seven it's the third manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We know it's when counsel is revealed, judgment can take place. Something which was concealed can be now revealed and understood. And there's a blessing in the seed. Remember, the, the seeds are going to begin to sprout. And there's always blessing in the seed because the seed will reseed itself, like those generations. The, the righteous remnant of one generation builds the foundation for the seed of the next generation who sows the seed and builds the foundation for the next generation. It doesn't skip. So it says, he brought the man of God, and in this context, the man of God is Elisha. Remember, he was a disciple of Eliyahu, Elijah, and he wanted double miracles. Uh, so there was a price to pay. But Elisha is now going around performing miracles. It says, a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Right? Now, what do we remember about the third day? It corresponds to the first fruits of the barley. What is about to be revealed here? The spirit of counsel is going to reveal something that has been concealed. Okay. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. And his attendant said, what? Will I set this before a hundred men? But he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate, and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. He said, well, 
Where do you see that? Where is this according to the word of the Lord? Well, it's coming through the prophet, the judge, the counselor. The, the prophet is the one who is going to reveal that which was concealed according to the spirit of counsel. So in this multiplying of the bread that's going to occur, and it will occur with these barley loaves and the, the fresh ears of grain. And this is actually a story. There's more details in Hebrew, but we can't all read Hebrew. Uh, so sometimes we have to rely on someone else to help us understand how this word means this, and this word can be translated as that. But that's the simple understanding of what happened, that instead of taking his first roots to the temple in this particular case, and it might have been occurring at a time when, uh, remember the northern kings would put up barricades to prevent the, the northern tribes from celebrating the feasts in Jerusalem and taking their tithes and offerings there. This could have occurred during one of those times where maybe it was impossible for him to take his first fruits down to Jerusalem. So rather than offer them to one of the two golden calves that Jeroboam set up, one in Bethel and one in the territory of Dan, maybe he says, I can do the second best thing. I will take them to the prophet. I would rather take them to a righteous prophet than offer them to a golden calf. No, first choice would be to go to Jerusalem, but it wasn't always possible for the northern tribes to do that. But here's the interesting thing. As we're looking here at 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44, if you will read the long story, read what comes before, read what comes after, you will realize that this includes the story of the resurrection of the Shunammite woman's son. And it says he died when the day came that he went out to his father to the reapers. So you can see how the two things are connected in that one chapter, that the Shunammite woman, her son is going to be resurrected from the dead. He went out to his father, to the reapers, during the time of the reaping of the barley. And so he's going to be resurrected. Remember, the first fruits of the barley is offered here, and then you continue reaping until Shavuot, and then at Shavuot, you start reaping the wheat. So it's occurring right here, probably between there and there, if you want to look at a specific time. So while his father is out with the reapers during this time, the boy goes out there, of course, he falls ill, he dies. And then, you know, uh, Elisha comes, resurrects him from the dead. But that resurrection miracle is occurring during the barley harvest reaping. So there we get our number three again. And, you know, he shouldn't have to make that connection for us because we already know that the barley harvest is celebrated on the third day, the third day of the feast, not the literal third day, but in terms of the, the chronology, the timeline of the seven feasts themselves. We know that the third day is associated with resurrection. And then, and this little story that we may have skipped over, it connects itself to that resurrection story, that third day resurrection story with the bringing of the first fruits of the barley. And so there is a kind of resurrection from the dead, even within that story. It's brought by a master of the third. And he says, okay, feed these men of God, feed these righteous people. And what's going to happen is something very similar to what happened in the cloud in the wilderness. When the people ate the manna, remember, there was always enough. No matter what they gathered, it was exactly what they needed to be satisfied. There was enough water for them to never run out until Miriam died. 
And then Moses and Aaron got into a little trouble because they misunderstood the situation. But there was never any reason for them to run out of water because Yeshua was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. He was the bread of heaven. He feeds with the water and the bread of heaven so that we can eat until we're full and we don't have to worry that there won't be any more in the morning. There'll be plenty. The bread will come through the water. And so this story is, is very specific to the resurrection from the dead. Now, and let's jump into the Gospels now. Let's find out why was Yeshua more than a prophet? Because Elisha was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Maybe the Baal Shalisha was a prophet. At least he prophetically knew what his first roots were, were supposed to do for the prophets, for the man of God, and the men of God that had gathered with him. But let's, let's read a little bit longer passage. This is going to be uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Verses 1 through 14. So, after these things, Yeshua went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And actually... Um, it's in an area today you would say is it, around Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Remember the third blessing? It associates the bread and the drink with, uh, what? how did they word it? It'll be therapeutic. It'll be healing. Then Yeshua went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Yeshua, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here. Now, this has really nothing to do with the story, but it's good to know. If you've got a toolbox, if you've got a toolkit, if you're writing down in a notebook, phrases or words that are prophetic signs, uh, prophetic things that tell you more about what's going on in the story. If you ever see a um, young man or young woman, sometimes it'll be worded lad, like it is right here, a lad or a, a maiden, a young maiden. In Hebrew, it's going to be na'ar or for a female, na'ara, like Abraham took his young men. There's multiple examples. When you see a young boy or a young girl, you're about to read something super prophetic. All right, it's just like if you look at the sand in the hourglass and how it, once it gets to the narrow part, it gets a lot stronger. You're coming down the era, narrow you know, place right there, like, okay, super prophetic right here when you see the young man or the young woman. So where it says there is a lad here, there's a young man here, something super prophetic is about to happen, who has five barley loaves and two fish. First fruits of the barley is right here. And you can see that we're in the season now. It says Passover's coming. We're in this spring season. There's something of the resurrection that's about to be prophesied here. It's, and Yeshua says, and not, not only that, it says two fish. So we've got barley loaves, but the fish were created on the fifth day of creation. But what do you notice? They're connected right here. The third day and the manufacturing of the menorah, these two branches would have had the same origin 
And that's why the third day is associated with the resurrection from the dead, specifically Messiah Yeshua's. But the fifth day, the Feast of Trumpets, is associated with the greater resurrection of the dead, the body of Messiah. So it's showing you both spring resurrection and then resurrection again in the fall. So it's, it's not random that it's barley loaves and two fish. He says, so there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Yeshua said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. That might be important. So the men, why would it be important? When does the first grass appear on the dry land? Third day. Does it need to tell us that there was grass? Not unless it means something. So that helps us trace it again to the third day. So the men sat down and number about 5,000. Now, tell me again, 5,000, we had two fish. Fish were created on the fifth day. And the number of people is 5,000. Five multiplied by 1,000. And remember, the promise to Abraham is to 1,000 generations. Five times 1,000. 5,000. Two fish. Yeshua then took the loaves, and having given thanks, right? You do a bracha, a blessing before a meal, and then you do blessings after the meal. So we see that Yeshua is following the custom. He's pronouncing these blessings, which makes us think, in the closing blessing, would they have prayed this third blessing about the food about the miracle that he's just about to do here, like, is prophetic. When he had given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, you think by now we're getting it? Come on, I'll make you fishers of people, fishers of people, which people? He wants the people that are going to resurrect with him on the fifth day. He wants all the way to the thousandth generation. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. That transaction convinced those who saw it that he was truly the prophet who was to come into the world. Why was this barley bread and two fish and the 12 baskets left over. Why was that such an important sign of the prophet? Well, remember prophecy, we always talk about prophecy being fulfilled and that can be misleading because prophecy is fulfilled multiple times and often according to the schedule of the feast days. So when it recycles, you might see something very similar, just like you see similar miracles in the life of Elisha that you saw in the life of Eliyahu, of Elijah. It'll just keep rotating, but it'll be more specific to that generation. It won't be identical, but you'll be able to see the bullet points. You'll have, you can see the skeleton of what happened before. So yes, it'll be redone, but not in exactly the same way. It'll show you a different viewpoint of the same reason the miracle was performed. So in this case, Elisha, and his full name, by the way, is Elishua. Just like Yeshua is the short form of Yehoshua. So we've got Elishua slash Elisha, who is about to do something that Yehoshua slash Yeshua will do again. 
that the people are going to connect together and say, this is the prophet. So Elisha feeds 2,000 men plus 200 with 20 loaves of barley and two measures of soft grain, of soft barley. Yeshua feeds 5,000 with five loaves of barley and two fish. Now, what we're seeing here is Yeshua multiplies by 1,000 the miracle. Again, why 5,000? Because he's showing us that Tower of David, that, that he is that Tower of Salvation, and each generation can hang their shield on him. He is a Tower of Salvation to his king. And so... It will help them to recall that promise that extends to a thousand generations of the covenant. Now, where did I get such a high number for Elisha? Again, that's why I want to say sometimes the, the English doesn't help us navigate through the Hebrew so well, but there's clues to how the Hebrew text was understood from Midrashic sources. And the context clues to help us understand that is that when he asked the question about a loaf to each man, the understanding is that each loaf would feed 100 men. And because the soft grains are listed in plural, that's a grammatical construct in Hebrew, like um, Shavua is weak, Shavuaim is two weeks. Um, there's, that's how you make the plural. In other words, two, two things, not just big plural, but the plural is in the number two or a pair, right? Uh, so the soft grains are listed like that in the plural. And so it's interpreted from Jewish translators as a minimum of two a minimum of a pair. And then we saw how, again, the barley and the fish, they are what we call chiastic. They are mirrors of one another. So one thing really explains the other. Uh, and again, we've got resurrection all within the context of this story. Uh, We've got not only this, we've got a Midrash, which is a, a Jewish story or a Jewish explanation to particular passages of Scripture. In this case, it's a commentary to the Song of Songs that we started with, with the shields of a thousand generations. Uh, the Tower of David. And here's what they say about that. All the thousands and myriads that crossed the Jordan River and whom I shielded, and that's from the Canaanite kings, I shielded only in the merit of the one who came for a thousand generations. That is Yehoshua. You can find that in Pirkei Avot 1 1. I mean, it's like chapter 1, verse 1. So, from the, the Jewish standpoint, the thousands who crossed the Jordan River and who were protected in ancient times and who will also cross over and be protected in future times will be done in the merit of one person, just one person. And that person will appear for the benefit of a thousand generations. And they name that person. His name is Yehoshua. Yehoshua, the short form, Yeshua. What was the long form of Elisha? Elishua. You hear how similar that is? How you can tie those two together? Elishua, Elisha, multiplied the bread. Yeshua. Short form of Yehoshua multiplied the bread. And what did the people say? This is surely the prophet. This is the one who has come 
for a thousand generations. Our salvation will be only in his merit. And it says, it is not you alone who depended upon the merit of Yehoshua, but all the mighty men. Remember the shields? For anyone who rises and rules and prevails over his evil inclination, such as Moses in his time, David in his time, Ezra in his time, their whole generation depends on their merit. So what's the message here? It's a big message. Yeshua is not only echoing the resurrection prophecy of Elisha, but he's also reminding us that it's only in his merit that the Father is going to perform his word to a thousand generations. And that's a figurative number, by the way. Don't sit and try to calculate how many generations and multiply by a thousand and think you're going to come up with a, a year number. That's not what that number functions as in Scripture. It's a symbolic number. It's a symbolic number that means the fulfillment, the end of the covenant promise, the total fulfillment of it. Uh, it's not for you to do math with. Um, you can put that in your toolkit if you want. Uh, so yes, Yeshua is pulling down all these understandings, taking them all the way back to the, the days of creation, all the way from the grass that appeared on the third day, all the way to the resurrection from the dead, to the, the promise fulfilled to a thousand generations and everything we talked about in between there. Yeshua is truly the prophet of the word. Can you imagine them sitting there and putting all that together? But again, like I just read you, there's lots of Jewish thought about the Messiah and the resurrection and so forth. And in this, they hit the nail on the head. And they knew this even back at the time that Yeshua lived. Every generation depends upon the merit of Yeshua's salvation. But each generation as well depends up, upon the righteous remnant within Abraham's descendants. Within those thousand generations are Abraham's descendants who are the mighty men that they're talking about. The ones who answer the call to duty the ones who declare the coming holy days. Did you see how everything was right on track with understanding the feast days? This is why the feast days are being restored at this time. It's our duty to call people to those holy days, to the Shabbat, and especially the Feast of Trumpets, because remember, a fifth day is coming when the righteous dead within the body of Messiah will be raised. And so, well, it's thought that the righteous remnant will be sealed at Shavuot and then just instantly resurrected from the dead at the shofar sound on the Feast of Trumpets. There's still going to be a lot of lukewarm people, as Yeshua calls them, who don't make that call, but they still got 10 days grace time to repent, to return, and to be counted when that second shofar blows on Yom HaKippurim. And so we don't want anybody to miss those shofar calls. We want everybody, no matter who they are, we want everybody to be able to see Yeshua in us. We want to be the mighty people of our generation. We want to be the righteous remnant of our generation. When we check out, we want to hang our shields and not be ashamed because we will know that we have declared the footsteps of Messiah to our generation. And I think this is what they understood. Yes, Yeshua is more than a prophet. <laughs>